Welcome back to another episode of Wrong Sports. And every college football season has some chaos, and some years have more than others. But to kick off this news series, I'm going to be covering a year of utter chaos that had to happen for a non Power 5 school to win college football's national title. If you weren't around in 1984 or don't know about the story of BYU and their 1984 national title, it needed a lot of chaos and a series of fortunate events for BYU to have gotten their national title. But before I get to that series of fortunate events for BYU, make sure you subscribe to the channel, please, below, and ring the bell so you can get updates on when I'm going to be dropping new episodes. And make sure you check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash wrongsports. Follow me on Twitter at wrongsports and like and share this video. So you may know BYU for a few reasons besides football, like the fact that it is named for one of the more famous Mormon figures and one of the largest colleges sponsored by the Mormon church. But along with all of that, this school really got on the national radar in football due to their offensive performances and consistently winning throughout the 1960s and 1970s. But when the 1980s came, BYU tried to stamp their name forever, but could never really get over that hump. The previous season, 1983, they had a blistering offense that scored 505 points for a new school record, but they were only ranked number 7 when the season ended. This was because the team would lose their first game to a 7-win Baylor team before beating 7-win UCLA by 2, and then rattling off convincing wins over their WAC schools like Air Force, which also ended the season ranked but the rest of the Western Athletic Conference weren't considered top-notch by pollsters. And whenever you won the Western Athletic Conference, you always went to the Holiday Bowl and thus never cracked the national title conversation. But the lower rankings weren't a new thing for BYU, obviously, as they had three straight double-digit win seasons from 1979 to 1981, but they couldn't break into the top 10. And this was with replacing their QB pretty much every year or so, and most of them went pro, like Jim McMahon and Steve Young. 1984 would be the same as they would have to replace Jim McMahon and they would bring in a new quarterback in quarterback Robbie Bosco. Their offense would keep churning along their season, but they didn't have big scoring games. They mostly had lower scoring games due to a much improved defense. But while I just told you a little bit about the team that will eventually reap the benefits of this crazy season, let's get into all of the craziness because BYU doesn't show up for a couple of weeks. The first fortunate thing that would happen for BYU would happen in the new Week Zero, which just started a few years earlier, and it would basically be an extra non-conference game. Number one Auburn was upset in that Week Zero as they would face the defending national champions Miami. Now I know that sounds kind of strange, but Miami was lower ranked than Auburn, and that was because Auburn had Bo Jackson. And along with that, they had 30 first place votes, which was 25 more than the next team. So they were a highly ranked number one team. Due to that win, when the next poll came out, it propelled Miami to number one. And our friends at BYU had a big time game versus number three Pittsburgh this week. Pittsburgh were coming off an eight win 1983 season and had a great offensive line that were feared and also had future NFL Hall of Famer and College Hall of Famer Bill Freilich running that line. The game was a hard fought game all first half, but BYU had a 3 0 lead into the half. The second half was where the scoring would finally come out, as Pittsburgh got 14 in the third quarter, while BYU scored 17, including 11 in the final quarter, to win 20 14 and score their biggest win for the last couple of years. The win got BYU ranked number 13 as they would meet Baylor the next week. And it wasn't like their previous year as BYU took a 34-7 halftime lead to win this game easily and got a little revenge on Baylor and they were now ranked number 8 as they were going into their third game. Now that was a lot of moving and shaking for the first couple of weeks, and the reason for their move up the rankings were not only due to their schedule of teams they had beaten, but also because Miami had lost this week to Michigan, dropping them out of the top spot and putting Nebraska at number one. Now remember all of these teams, because they will come up as we continue the rest of this season. 
but now Nebraska would be our third number one team, and they would only have the top spot for two weeks before a stunning 17-9 upset on the road to Syracuse, and Syracuse were coming off of a shutout loss to Rutgers the previous week. So following this with a stunning win over Nebraska was pretty big. So now that Nebraska lost, we are going to have another new number one team, and this time it would be Texas. Nebraska would drop to number eight, just one spot behind our main character BYU as BYU was now number 7 in the AP and number 6 in the coaches poll. But they had a close call on September 22nd against Hawaii, as they took a 12-point lead, only to be down 13-12 entering the fourth quarter and needing a late TD to win the game 18-13. The close win dropped them back two spots, but by the start of October and due to losses above them, they would get back near the top five. October would only have two teams being named to number one, but more of the craziness that would help BYU would happen a little bit below number one. The first big thing to happen would be the Red River Shootout on October 13th. It was pitting number two and number three, and it would be a slugfest. The rain would be coming down most of the game, and it would cause havoc in the second half, as Texas had a 10-0 lead go away in the third quarter, as Oklahoma capitalized on the rain with a safety and two touchdowns to take a 15-10 lead. But the weirdness wasn't done, as Texas would get their own safety from Oklahoma, and then a late field goal to end the slugfest in a 15-15 tie. The tie caused Texas to drop from number one, and in some polls, Oklahoma was ranked number two, with Texas ranked number three. Along with all that shuffling, a team out of the East was a lot like BYU, and they were starting to make headlines now in the top five. That team was Boston College, which had Doug Flutie, and they were winning as well as putting up a lot of points in their games. By the start of October, they were number four, after outdueling top 10 Alabama in September, and then had a three-week break at the end of September through October 13th, which is kind of strange, but it was because they played a December game. Because of the long break to Boston College, BYU wasn't able to jump them until October 20th, when BC got beaten by one point to West Virginia. But don't worry, we'll be hearing a little bit more from Boston College later in the season. But BYU would continue to lay in the weeds throughout the month of October, but got their toughest test in back-to-back -back weeks as they played Wyoming and Air Force, which finished just behind BYU the previous year. Wyoming almost stunned BYU in Provo, but BYU would pull a three-point win out, and then the next week BYU would have to struggle to a five-point win over Air Force on the road. These two wins put BYU back at number seven for a few weeks, but by the beginning of November, the Cougars were back at number four, waiting for some more chaos to happen above them that they could reap the benefits of. So now we're in November, and Washington was now our new number one team, with Texas at number two, Nebraska with their one loss at number three, and BYU undefeated still at number four. But this would all change on November 10th, with Washington losing after holding a lead through three quarters, but then they gave up 10 points in the fourth quarter to USC to suffer their first loss and tumble to number eight. Nebraska would now be the new number one again with a new surprising number two team, the undefeated South Carolina Gamecocks. Now, I haven't mentioned much about South Carolina. That was because they weren't really imperative to the story of BYU until now. South Carolina was under the radar coming into the season, as they were only 5-6 and six the previous season. But this year, they had four straight wins to start the season, including beating ranked Georgia to get themselves ranked. South Carolina would then continue to move their way up after beating Notre Dame, and then they beat top 10 Florida State to leapfrog BYU and be number two. So we've had a handful of number one teams already. Nebraska has been number one, not once, but twice. And now South Carolina out of nowhere is now number two. So this season has been crazy already, but November 17th was the reckoning of this season. Nebraska was already coming into this week with a loss and a target on their back as they played number six Oklahoma. And Oklahoma shut down Nebraska's offense and beat them 17 to seven in Lincoln and this meant that there would be a new number one team definitely because Nebraska lost. South Carolina was looking to become that team as they traveled to Maryland to play Navy. Navy were a very unsuspecting team as they only had three wins, two of them against mid-majors or FCS schools right now pretty much. 
and they were coming off of a shutout by Syracuse. This game was close and sloppy for South Carolina, with both teams committing five turnovers by the half. But after the half, Navy took over as they had a 31-7 lead going into the fourth quarter. South Carolina would eventually start to get some points on the board, but it was far too late for a comeback, and they lost, shockingly, to unranked Navy. 38 to 21, and now the number one and number two teams both lost in the same day. But that last loss by Navy was completely shocking because Navy had only beaten one Division I A team before this win, and the next week Navy would lose again to complete their season 4, 6, and 1. But the win over South Carolina pretty much makes you forget about all those losses this season. So now, with all of that weirdness and craziness and upsets on November 17th, it would finally propel BYU to number one, and they got 40 first place votes, which would be the most that they would get the rest of the season. Right behind BYU was Oklahoma, who would play Oklahoma State the next week after the poll, with Oklahoma coming out 24-14. to But the win didn't push Oklahoma past BYU, due to Oklahoma's tie over Texas, and also losing to unranked Kansas a month before, but the win also took some first place votes away from BYU, so it was getting a little close as the season was ending. But with the final poll of the regular season coming out, BYU was number one, with Oklahoma number two, Florida at number three, and Florida had a very weird season as they started one, one, and one, they then fired their coach, and then they pulled off an eight game winning streak to end their season nine, one, and one and at number four was Washington. Now, I have to mention Florida again being at number three, which was very significant, because due to an NCAA investigation, they fired their coach, and they would subsequently not be able to go to a bowl game due to those NCAA violations. So with Florida not factored into the national title conversation, Washington at number four was interesting, as they didn't win their conference as they lost to USC, so they weren't invited to the Rose Bowl. That instead went to USC, who had three losses, but they only had one loss in the conference, and since they beat Washington, they had the tiebreaker. So instead, Washington would be invited to the Orange Bowl to play number two Oklahoma. So now with number two and four taken up, and number three not being able to go to a bowl, BYU was kind of stuck because they were stuck going to the Holiday Bowl. And the Holiday Bowl was considered at the time not really a big game. It was played before Christmas, and it's still played mostly around Christmas time now, and it's mostly considered a mid-level bowl now. But the Western Athletic Champion always went to that bowl game. BYU also made the Holiday Bowl must-see TV, as they had great games versus SMU and Washington State over the last five years. But the game wasn't really on any big team's minds. This was also because the Holiday Bowl only offered 500,000 to teams that wanted to go to the game, which would be kind of tough for Eastern and Midwestern schools to convince a bunch of fans to come to this game if they weren't really going to be making a lot of money for it. Due to this, BYU had trouble getting an opponent as they tried for Boston College, with now Heisman winner Doug Flutie to come to this game, but they couldn't convince them because Boston College didn't want to fly out west and that low price tag for teams. While that was happening, there was also a rumor that the Fiesta Bowl was negotiating with BYU to play the game against defending national champion Miami, who only had eight wins at the time, but BYU would decline that. With time running out and seeing Oklahoma State accept an invite to the Gator Bowl and several other second and third place teams from the Big Ten and Big 12 accept other bowl invites, the Holiday Bowl was stuck with extending an invitation to Michigan. Any other year though, Michigan coming to this game would be huge because it's Michigan and they were usually near the top or at the top of the Big Ten. But this wasn't that year as they were only six and five and five and four in the Big Ten. And they also lost their starting quarterback, Jim Harbaugh, for the season. So this was a completely different Michigan team. But Michigan did make some news at the beginning of the season because they defeated the number one Miami team, causing a lot of madness at the beginning of the season. Unfortunately, after the Jim Harbaugh injury, their season went up and down, and they ended it with a 21-6 loss to Ohio State, and they were looking for pretty much any bowl invite. And when the Holiday Bowl came calling, they accepted. 
so the game was set for December 21st, and it would be about a week before any other top five team would play their bowl game. Before the game, BYU wasn't getting a lot of credit from the media and coaches that were looking for BYU to somehow lose this game, so the Orange Bowl between number two Oklahoma and number four Washington would decide the national champion, which was coming up on New Year's Day. In addition, Coach Bo Schembechler from Michigan was skeptical of BYU, as their schedule wasn't really as daunting as playing the Big Ten schedule that Michigan did, as well as playing Miami. And Michigan also played Washington as well to start the their season, so they went through pretty much a murderer's row this season. But the Holiday Bowl was a slugfest and a fight from the get-go, as Michigan picked off Robbie Bosco in the first quarter and also took him out for a bit after a big hit. The second quarter had scoring as BYU took a 10-7 lead into half, but Robbie Bosco was still hurting after that hit from the first quarter. After half, Michigan took the lead in the third quarter, and BYU looked like they were going to lose this game and lose the national title because they kept turning the ball over as they had five turnovers through three quarters. But when the final quarter came, BYU started and hit their comeback as Robbie Bosco led them to two touchdowns with the last one in the final 90 seconds to give them the 24-17 win. The win was really ugly, as Robbie Bosco was barely able to stand after the game. There were six turnovers, with three interceptions and three fumbles. And Michigan also led in time of possession and had maybe half the amount of yards as BYU. BYU got out with a win because of their passing game, having over 300 yards, and because Michigan's offense pretty much struggled, like I said, with all of the injuries and backups playing, as they had less than 200 total yards. Even though BYU won, Coach Bo Schembechler from Michigan didn't give BYU really any credit after the game, as he said BYU was a mid-level Big Ten team, which was surprising since Michigan was a mid-level Big Ten team right now, but I think he meant like Illinois, Indiana, teams that are usually in the middle of the Big Ten, which is kind of a knock, but he does have some knowledge on that fact. BYU would end their season though 13-0, but it wasn't a foregone conclusion as they still had to wait about 10 days until the New Year and Bowl Mania Day, where the Orange Bowl, Rose Bowl, Sugar Bowl, Fiesta, and Cotton Bowls would all happen. The biggest game though would be happening late on January 1st, as it pitted number 4 versus number 2, and if either team could win really big and really dominant, they might be able to turn some pollsters their way. But that didn't happen, as the Orange Bowl was a lot like the Holiday Bowl, as it had seven total turnovers, with Washington winning 25 to 17 to end their season 11 and 1. But they didn't win their conference, thus pollsters didn't want to put them as the national champion. Nebraska would end up winning their bowl game over SEC champion LSU, but since Nebraska wasn't the conference winner, they couldn't be declared the national champion. But Oklahoma was declared the Big 12 champion winner, but since they lost their bowl game, it didn't really matter. And finally, I mentioned this before, but Florida was under NCAA violations, plus they had one loss and a tie, and BYU was completely undefeated so they were declared the national champion by the AP and the coaches, finally cementing their legacy in college football history. But BYU's schedule was mostly the reason for their national title win getting a little bit tainted. The team did start with a win over a number three ranked Pittsburgh, but Pitt would end the year with a losing record, and most of the teams they played this year had four losses or more. Robbie Bosco would end the season with over 3,800 yards and 33 touchdowns, and he would lead the team next year to an 11-3 record, and they were again declared co-champions of the Western Athletic Conference. But since they weren't declared declared the champions, they didn't go to the Holiday Bowl, this time they went to the Citrus Bowl, and they would be ranked number 16 at the end of the season. BYU would never be ranked number one again, but got into the top five numerous times over the next decades. And the reason for this is what we come accustomed to if you've been watching college football for the last 20 years, and that is giving the Power Five more credit than the lower level conferences. So if you were in the Big Ten, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC. Even if you were Notre Dame, you would get a lot more credit over a team from Conference USA or the Mountain West or the Western Athletic Conference. So BYU winning the national title in 1984 was pretty unprecedented and it doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon unless a team can crack the playoff and make their way through that playoff too. 
But there you go. I hope you enjoyed this episode all about the 1984 season and how a bunch of craziness and fortunate events enabled BYU to become the national champion. If you enjoyed it, please like this video, please share this video, and of course, please subscribe to the channel, please, and ring the bell below so you can get updates on when I'm going to be dropping a new video. Of course, check me out on Patreon, patreon.com slash wrongsports. And finally, check me out on Twitter at sportswronged, and have a fantastic day, guys.